Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, getting out the women's vote. New Jersey Citizen Action has Republican Congressman Tom MacArthur in their crosshairs, calling on women to vote him out. The biomedical industry is growing in New Jersey. A new company has just set up shop to take advantage of. A Union County Wildlife Center is offering educators a unique way to teach students about endangered species without them ever having to leave the classroom. Plus, technology that monitors your vital signs before you get to the doctor? There's an app for that. And sports betting's branching out. William Hill's made a deal with the devils. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. President Trump is not on the ballot in the staunchly Republican 3rd Congressional District, but the only New Jersey representative to vote for the GOP tax cuts and one of those who voted for President's repeal of Obamacare, Republican Tom MacArthur, is. And he's in a neck-and-neck -neck race for re-election. Brianna Venosi is with some forces aligning against him. Brianna? Hi, Mary Alice. This isn't the first event New Jersey Citizen Action has held in this vein. Last week, as a matter of fact, they held a rally urging female voters to unseat Republican incumbent Leonard Lance. Today, though, they set their sights on the 3rd District and Tom MacArthur. Now, specifically, they were targeting MacArthur's votes to help repeal and replace the ACA and his work with health care. As you know, that seems to be the top issue on voters' minds this election cycle. First Lady Tammy Murphy headlined today's events along with two cancer survivors and other activists. They all pledged their support for the Democratic challenger, Andy Kim. The fact that he is uh, pushing for, or he helped pass the legislation to give tax breaks to the wealthy and to the big corporations on the one hand, and he has promised to repeal the Affordable Care Act on the other hand, that in and of itself should be enough for all of us here in our great state of New Jersey to say no way, no more. Congressman MacArthur went out of his way to author and introduce an amendment to repeal and replace the ACA. He was not acting in the best interests of his constituents. In fact, his actions would hurt Americans as a whole. Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman was expected to be here today, but we're told she took ill and had to pull out last minute. Now, this event was held here in Burlington. We're on High Street. This is a Democratic stronghold for Andy Kim. The district stretches across the southern half of the state from Burlington County to Eastern Ocean, and that's where Tom MacArthur's strongest supporters are. Now, a new poll came out today from Monmouth University, and it puts the two candidates in a statistical dead heat. It's relatively unchanged from last poll in August. Take a look. Kim has a 48% lead to MacArthur's 46%. More notable, though, is the change in favorable opinions about the candidates. Potential voters polled are growing more negative about Tom MacArthur. 34% have an unfavorable opinion. That's roughly a 10% increase since August. Now, equally the same, about 35% have a favorable view. And it could be due to ads tying the incumbent to special interests. Now, we reached out to Tom MacArthur's campaign, and a spokesperson sent us this statement regarding First Lady Tammy Murphy's involvement. Quote, we would suggest it takes a tremendous amount of chutzpah to do a press conference lecturing anyone about how women should be treated in light of what we learned about the inner workings of the Murphy campaign and administration in the last couple weeks. He's referring, of course, to the investigation into the hiring of a Murphy aide who's accused of sexually assaulting a fellow Murphy campaign worker last year. The race is heating up down here. Mary Alice? 
Thanks, Brianna. Next week, Republican Representative Tom MacArthur and his Democratic challenger Andy Kim face off right here as NJTV hosts our final Wednesday night debate ahead of the midterm elections. And you can join the debate on air or online starting at 8. Betting is all business. Rhonda Schaffler's here with all that and more. Rhonda? Mary Alice, it's not often that a state gets an entire new industry, but New Jersey got just that when sports betting was legalized. And this business continues to grow. The latest players in the game, the New Jersey Devils and Newark's Prudential Center, which have signed a multi-year agreement with William Hill. With this deal, a sports lounge will be open for all Devils games, concerts and special events at the arena for fans to place bets. William Hill also operates sports books at Monmouth Park and several Atlantic City casinos. Separately, William Hill has sued its sports betting rival FanDuel, which also operates in New Jersey, for allegedly copying its How to Bet guide. The copyright infringement suit was filed earlier this week, seeking unspecified damages against FanDuel, which declined to comment on the litigation. New Jersey's Public Worker Pension Fund will continue to hold shares of Nike, dismissing a request to sell the stock. The request was made by a representative for police and firefighters who was unhappy with the company's new ad campaign featuring former NFL player Colin Kaepernick, who protested during the national anthem at NFL games. The State Investment Council said Nike stock's been a good performer for the investment fund. Remember that big sell-off on Wall Street yesterday? Today, the markets reversed course and recovered much of that loss. The Dow rose more than 400 points. One of the world's biggest companies, Google, disclosed today that it fired 48 people over the last two years for sexual harassment. Thirteen of them were managers. The disclosure came after a New York Times story about sexual misconduct at the company. Shares of Kenilworth-based Merck fell today. Its revenue fell short of expectations when it released its quarterly earnings report. New Jersey small businesses received a record amount of loans in the last fiscal year. The U.S. Small Business Administration said it signed off on $905 million in loans. Sixty percent of that funding went to startups. Governor Murphy's been talking a lot about startups and the innovation economy, and that theme was prevalent during his recent trip to Germany and Israel. Earlier today, I spoke with Anjali Kamlani, managing director of ROI, who accompanied the governor on his trip. I asked her if the governor's trip accomplished his goals. I think the goal was definitely to sort of uh, advertise New Jersey, as well as get some conversations rolling about who's interested in coming here, growing here, expanding here. And I would say that he definitely got the message across, whether or not uh, anyone bit remains to be seen. Well, that's what's interesting, right? Because New Jersey, unfortunately, often ranks near the bottom of many surveys as a good place to do business. So wasn't it a bit of a tough sell for the governor? It was not it wasn't. So there's an advantage for being overseas. Here, you know, in the Northeast region, we sort of have this bias about uh, New Jersey and everyone knows about, it, about its business climate. But I think overseas, you can kind of sell it as a really good central point uh, between the Washington-Boston corridor. And so some people do kind of see it that way. They understand that there is some value to that. And depending on what the businesses uh, are looking for, I think that there is some uh, selling point there. Certainly pharma, biotechnology. Absolutely. I mean, that's what we're known for here in Anything New Jersey. Anything that needs the ports as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the governor you wrote about was talking frequently about the Evergreen Fund, which is something that he put out there with his broad plan for helping New Jersey's economy, and it's basically trying to get investment. Why was he selling that message overseas? Shouldn't that be a message that he's selling here at home? Was it a trial balloon he was floating up there? I think the, I think there's already an appetite. Based on my understanding of the conversations he's had, there's already an appetite for it here. So I think it was a trial balloon for overseas. I think that um, it's going to be interesting to see now that we're trying a different sort of tax credit route, uh, whether or not the companies overseas see value in that as well. So what was the governor like kind of taken away from the spotlight of Trenton? Uh, did he seem to be a little bit different, more comfortable, less comfortable? Oh, I think he was uh, pretty much the same. I, I think uh, someone captured it really well. Uh, Wes Matthews at the EDA, who, who was a uh, chief of staff when he was at the uh, embassy, I think uh, cap captured it really well, saying that he uh, is just always going at a frenetic pace. And I think that that was very true. You could see that overseas. He's always just ready to go at the next. So what do you think the businesses will have to be convinced of now to decide to expand into New Jersey or increase operations here? What's the next step, I guess, from this trip? 
I think that definitely they're going to have to think about what is important to them, whether location or, uh, you know, like a cheap area to, to grow their business is important because it's not that New Jersey's uh, poor business climate wasn't invisible, or, you know, was invisible. It definitely was something that people knew about. Uh, the transit system is something people knew about. So I think that it just remains to be seen, you know, just what, what they're looking for and, and how they're going to decide based on that. He definitely had that theme of the innovation economy running pretty much through every day, it seems. Yes, yeah, he did. Um, that was that seemed to be the goal. It seemed to be less of a focus on uh, larger companies and and businesses that maybe you know could make the decision independently, and more companies that he was looking for to uh, be part of this uh, you know vision of a, an innovation economy that he has. That's the sense I got. Well, we're so glad you shared your version of the trip, and uh, I'm sure it was quite exciting to be there. Anjali Kamlani, thank you so much. Thank you. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. A 19th patient has been diagnosed with the adenovirus that's already claimed the lives of seven children at a pediatric rehabilitation center. State health officials say the resident had already been ill and warn it's possible that lab tests will confirm additional cases. All those infected are in a respiratory unit where patients are on ventilators, all with compromised immune systems. Officials say the outbreak won't be declared over until the Wanakue Center for Nursing and Rehabilitation can go four weeks without any new cases of ADNO-7 infections. New Jersey's biomedical science labs working to advance cell-based therapies have gotten a boost from a growing business. Michael Hill reports. Ready, one, two, three, Good. A ribbon cutting marks the opening of California-based Cryoport's East Coast Venture. Cryoport puts biomedical products in canisters at a minus 196 degrees Celsius and ships the cutting edge, life-saving, clinical trial therapeutic products to labs, clinics, and hospitals, the same way an Israeli company delivered the drugs or placebos by temperature control for this clinical trial at Holy Name Medical Center in June. The slightest change in temperature has a dramatic effect. Think about a drop of blood. A drop of blood has about five million cells in it. So you can see the size of these, the, this is very, very small. Think about putting a piece of ice in your hand, how quickly you want to get it out. Well, the temperature excursion on a small body like that is just almost immediate. It can distinguish it and, 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 you, and you lose the efficacy. Cryoport's chief says he looked at several locations east of the Mississippi and decided Livingston was ideal because of the growing biomedical industry in New Jersey. Because of the transportation, because of the uh, oh, we have the interstate system here. We've got a friendly community. We've got, uh, and we're, we're we're almost in the center of the uh, biologic activity of, of the pharmaceutical activity. We've got Novartis and Celgene almost equidistance from us, and then we have all those other clients around us here. So it just made logistical sense to be here. Made total sense. Some of the biggest names in biopharma operate in New Jersey. They welcome Cryoport as a neighbor and what it could mean for their business. Signals some strong growth for our industry and for personalized medicine, and it really uh, shows promise that we're able to provide uh, these novel products to our patients. I would say it, it's a great uh, thing for the industry. It's growing. Uh, it, we're looking into using services like Cryoport offers much more often, and having them close by is going to be definitely beneficial. Cryoport says it had to develop new products to meet the fast-growing demands of the market. With these sleeves inserts here, uh, to keep it at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius for 96 hours, Mater material goes inside, and then it also has our Smart Pack 2 condition monitor that's going to give you uh, location, temperature, humidity, light exposure, vibration, tilt. Cryoport CEO says the company supports 269 clinical trials, and it credits the decoding of the human genome for leading to the booming cell therapy research and development industry, one that has led to the hot demand for super cold transportation of biomaterials. It signals a revolution because this is the beginning. In Livingston, Michael Hill, NJTV News.
It's not new technology, but existing tech that's being harnessed in a new way to monitor patients' health to help them avoid medical emergencies. Leah Mishkin has the story. Patients with chronic diseases like diabetes, congestive heart failure, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease often end up being readmitted to the hospital or returning to the emergency department. But what if there was a way to catch early warning signs to prevent that from happening? One of the first pilot programs out of the Inspira Innovation Center is called Inspira Health Plus. So far to date, uh, we've had, with our trial, we had a 0% readmission rate, where you can see sometimes an upwards of 10 to 15%. A patient is sent home with devices prescribed based on their condition. For example, for bariatric patients, they'll get the activity tracker and the scale because it's important to see the weight coming off and their activity increasing. The patient plugs everything into an app and the data is monitored by nurse navigators. It's not a 24-7 emergency response system, but if something seems off, the patient will get a phone call. Or in this case, a life-saving visit. First day we were monitoring one of the patients, we were not getting any response. We assumed it was an equipment problem. We had one of our nurses or one of our techs go out to the house. The fellow had collapsed. He had C, uh, CHF. And if we hadn't done that, he would have died. Before that, we had, we had nurses who would make phone calls. Okay? It's very time consuming. Um, didn't work as, nearly as well. Devices like Alexa are also being tested to help improve patient care. What is the nearest urgent care? Our nearest urgent care to you is in Glassboro. Its address is 200 Rowan Boulevard. The goal is to have any patient with an Alexa device in their home be able to ask where is the nearest urgent care, what are the wait times, and eventually check them in. The current wait time at Glassboro Urgent Care is 2 hours 15 minutes. There are currently 10 people in line. At our urgent cares, whenever you visit them, uh, you have to get in line. Uh, and when you do that, your uh, a patient identifier basically is put into our system and that number of how many people are in line is available on our website and basically this is pulling that data. Then they're taking it a step further and seeing how they'll be able to incorporate Alexa into a patient's hospital room. Can you actually use your voice to call your nurse to control your settings on your TV, your volume, change the channel, uh, turn the lights up and down, order your food? all from your voice. The technology being used is not new, so why is it just now being incorporated into the healthcare world? Reimbursement from insurances, they didn't see the value in it. They're starting to see the value in it, and I believe that they have changed their rates and their uh, regulations around it. But there's definitely some concerns that people have with using voice and active listening devices like Alexa. We're looking at writing third, uh, third party like middleware to prevent um, any HIPAA compliance issues, so it's a concept right now, uh, and when we're certain it's ready and it's secure, uh, then we'll be ready. Ready on this idea and looking ahead at this new Inspira Innovation Center. In Mullica Hill, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. A special election after the election. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Jersey City, where the fate of a controversial statue will now be up to the voters. The Katyn Monument commemorates the 1940 Soviet massacre of more than 20,000 Polish people. Mayor Fulop proposed moving it from its longtime home at Exchange Place, bowing to a business group that wanted to put a park in its place. And the city council authorized relocating the statue a block away to York Street. Then voters opposing the move forced a referendum on the ballot, but not the November 6th ballot. They missed the deadline. So, on December 11th, voters will give the Catton statue's fate its own special election. Next to Egg Harbor Township and three special documentaries, little Stephen Van Zant's nonprofits, Teach Rock and Rock and Roll Forever Foundation, along with HBO, ask students nationwide to make a documentary about the cultural, biographical, and historical musical heritage of their hometowns. Of the nine greenlit films statewide, Three were produced by Egg Harbor Township students. They spotlight the Billy Walton Band, the Atlanta County Alternative Rock of the Second Side, and the urban-leaning rhythmic contemporary station WZBZ FM 99.3. Finally, Harrison, and we do mean finally, after five years of construction, that shiny new $256 million glass and steel pass station 
is scheduled to open next week with glass enclosed weather protected entrances, modern elevators, widened stairs and escalators to extended platforms that will accommodate longer 10 car trains. On October 30th, it will officially replace the more than 80 year old commuter cramped pass station the Pennsylvania Railroad built for a bygone era. And that's our Garden State Express for Thursday, October 25th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. A sit-in at Seton Hall. Dozens of university students are staging a three-day sit-in at the administration building, demanding better treatment for minority students and adequate funding for courses on diversity. State data indicates about 8% of Seton Hall students are African American, about 17% Hispanic. Senior university administrators have been working with a committee, which includes students, to improve its inclusion and diversity programming. Teachers know well the challenge of connecting urban children to where the wild things are. Now there's a program that helps teachers bring wildlife to them. Braven Santana reports. Elizabeth isn't exactly where you think of when you imagine a pair of peregrine falcons nesting, but here they are. They're on the roof of the city's courthouse, and these falcons are being streamed live on Union County's falcon cam. They're able to see the life cycle of a falcon. They'll, they'll start nesting at the end of March, uh, the beginning of April, and that mother will sit on her eggs. You can watch the eggs hatch in about 32 days. Children are amazed to find out that these birds actually are living in their own backyard. So who would think you have a species that's endangered? There's, I think, 70 birds in the state of New Jersey as of right now. I think the real cool thing about especially urban areas, it's hard to like find a link where falcons really thrive in urban areas and open areas, you know, because they really depend on what kind of prey is there. Uh, and in urban areas, there's lots of prey, you know, and they're a great species to control, you know, some pest species like we have, like, like pigeons and starlings and other blackbirds. The falcon cam is one of only two located in our state. The Conserve Wildlife Foundation is now holding training workshops to teach teachers how to add the Falcon Cam into their curriculum. And I think today, you know, in, in such a technological age, you know, getting any kid, even my own kids, off their phones or iPads or whatever, you know, is, is important. And using a tool like a, a camera, you know, to help engage them uh, and to, to possibly care or even just learn more about the species is important, I think, you know, and, and using that digital technology like that is, is definitely a way to do it. Teachers can stream that live feed into their classrooms, teaching students firsthand the importance of protecting endangered species. You know, kids today aren't getting out and exploring as much, and so I think if I can bring that into the classroom, it'll give them an experience that they might not have had on their own. We'll do um, reading uh, books that are based on birds, um, writing, keeping a journal, science, the STEM lessons that go along with the bird boxes and um, the children really enjoy it. And it's all aligned to our curriculum and our state standards. It's really important for us to uh, learn the, uh, about wildlife and also it's, it's building a love for science. So we want to make sure that children um, start early, get excited about science, technology, STEM careers, engineering, math, and that um, they build that trajectory straight up into college. The program is for K through 8th grade teachers and entirely funded by a grant from energy company Phillips 66. In Mountainside, Raven Santana, NJTV News. Some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Tom MacArthur has served as the representative for New Jersey's third congressional district since 2015. The new Harrison Path station cost $256 million and took five years to build. Governor Murphy made 48 stops on his eight day trip to Germany and Israel. And peregrine falcons are New Jersey's and the world's fastest animal, capable of flying at speeds of more than 
more than 200 miles an hour. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, monitoring the health of communities in range of Port Newark pollutants. And don't forget, next week, NJTV will host our final Wednesday night debate ahead of the midterm elections. Republican Representative Tom MacArthur and his Democratic challenger Andy Kim face off right here, and you can join the debate on air or online starting at 8. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Have some water. Sir. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton, and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.